Chapter 3. A Poem for Mrs. Scriven. In 1855, Mrs. Jane Scriven received a letter from her son Joseph. Over 3,000 miles separated them after Joseph's emigration to Canada from the family home in Banbridge, a town about 20 miles south of Belfast. Although she had a large family still living with her in Ireland, Jane missed her emigrated child intensely, as did so many Irish mothers in the middle of the 1800s. Mrs Scriven started to sicken with grief over Joseph's absence. No telephones, no calls, no easy way to travel to visit them. Letters, like voyages, took weeks. Often when a child or a loved one emigrated in the 1800s, it meant that their loved ones at home would never see their face again in this life. Hearing how his mother's grief was seriously impacting her health, Joseph composed and enclosed a poem for her with his most recent letter home. Joseph Scriven was a well-educated man. He had taken his bachelor's degree at Trinity College Dublin, one of the best universities in Europe at the time, and he'd find a job eventually in Canada as a private tutor to a wealthy family in South Ontario. Not that the Scrivens themselves were short of money. Joseph's father, John, was a retired army captain. Jane Scriven came from an affluent family of lawyers in Dublin. Joseph's poem to his mother focused on their shared sense of Christian faith. Jane Scriven was an Anglican. Her brother actually was an Anglican vicar serving in England. And in Bambridge, she and the rest of the Scriven family attended Holy Trinity Church St. Patrick, the local Church of Ireland parish church. By the 1850s, the once strict lines of delineation between the different Protestant denominations had started to blur, where once it would have been something of a scandal for Church of Ireland congregants to have had much to do with Presbyterians, those particular boundaries of prejudice had largely evaporated thanks to the Act of Union. The largest four denominations in the north of Ireland by the middle of the 19th century, Anglicans, Baptists, Methodists and Presbyterians, coexisted peacefully and even, albeit infrequently at this stage, attended one another's services. Jane's relationship with her son Joseph and their bond being strengthened by their Protestant faith was an example of this because although Joseph had been born, baptised, raised and confirmed in the Church of Ireland, by the time he wrote this poem to his mother, Joseph had joined the Brethren, a less liturgical, less hierarchical strain of Protestantism, but also one known for encouraging eventually more rigid adherence to biblical literalism than did the Church of Ireland. It was not supposed to have been like this, with Joseph living thousands of miles away in a continent his mother would never see, and from which it would be difficult, dangerous and lengthy for Joseph to return. Until his mid-twenties, Joseph Scriven had trod the path of an upper-middle-class man from a respected County Down family. The farthest he had been from home was to Addiscombe in England, when he had briefly considered following his father into a career in the army. Military college had not been for Joseph, and he'd come back to Ireland to study in his mother's home city of Dublin. After graduation in 1842, he'd fallen in love with a family friend from Bambridge. Incredibly, and this has actually been noted by a couple of other researchers, I have not been able to find out for definite what this lady's name was. Presumably, it would be in the parish records. He was still Church of Ireland at this point, so I would assume she probably was also a, a member of the Church of Ireland. Um... I didn't want to delay this episode another week in order to find it out, but I am going to find this lady's name out. It's like a little itch under my skin now. It's ridiculous so far that it doesn't seem to be in any of the literature about Joseph Scriven. Um, Very long story short, copy editing uh, my next book this week. So I haven't been able to get down to Banbridge or contact anyone there, but 
by the end of this season, I am going to try to have found this Lydia's name out, or at least a couple of credible possibilities. Uh, if anyone listening knows of any links to any sort of uh, historical societies in and around Banbridge, do let me know. Anyway, this lady accepted Joseph's proposal of marriage, but in August 1843, there was a freak storm in County Down with very heavy rain. The day before their wedding, Joseph's fiance was riding her horse in one of the usual spots where locals crossed or forded the River Ban, from which Bambridge Town gained its name. The horse bucked, threw her off, and she drowned in the swollen river waters. What would have been their wedding day instead became the day that the people of Bambridge woke to the news that the future Mrs Scriven had died. Absolutely devastated by what had happened to his fiancée, Joseph Scriven found comfort in the local brethren congregations, but not enough, and he decided to restart his life far away from the scenes of this tragedy. It is interesting to note that as support for the Union crystallised along religious lines, it seems to have had a knock-on effect on the patterns of Irish emigration, where Irish Catholics at the time overwhelmingly, although of course not universally, but overwhelmingly chose to emigrate to the United States, Irish Protestants increasingly preferred to emigrate to somewhere in the British Empire, with Canada proving the most popular. Once he got to Canada, Joseph supported himself as a labourer before getting work, as mentioned, as a tutor. On his days off or his evenings off, he preached the Bible. He tried different denominations to find a church that worked for him, including going back to Anglicanism. He gave Presbyterianism a word. He became engaged again, although this fiancé too passed away before their wedding after contracting pneumonia. He was a big gentleman. He's described by a a neighbour, excuse me, as a big man of pleasant countenance. Joseph was sincerely admired in his new Canadian hometown of Port Hope, where people nicknamed him the Good Samaritan. On weekends, when he had days off from being a tutor, full days off, Joseph went back to work as a labourer but only for families who could not afford to pay him, for he considered this the best way to show Christianity as his faith through action. Joseph's poem to his mother, his grieving mother, was somewhere between a prayer and a poem. And the words were so beautiful that Jane Scriven shared them. They ended up in a hymnal for the first time in 1865, A small collection of Joseph's poems was published in 1869, but it was only after his death in 1886 that Scriven's work became famous. Tragedy by water had come once again when, on a sweltering Canadian night, Joseph Scriven collapsed and drowned in the local lake. The poem that he had written in Canada for his mother in Bambridge went on to become one of the most famous and beloved modern Christian hymns under the title What a Friend or What a Friend We Have in Jesus. If you listen to the words and the music, for want of a better word to which it was set, I think it owes a lot to the necessary simplicity of Protestant worship in many of these communities, as it was with the Presbyterians in the rural communities where Scriven grew up. So it was with many Protestant congregations in Canada, they could not always count on having somebody there who knew how to play the piano, or at many congregations couldn't afford one for their church. So there's something appropriate about the fact that this poem that became a hymn can be performed a cappella or with music. Uh, And brethren communities, especially at the time Scriven was writing, relied on congregations being able to sing a cappella, as it were. Um, Joseph Scriven's words, preserved by his mother and set to music by an American admirer, became one of the most beloved Protestant hymns of the 19th and 20th centuries, and it has been sung at countless funerals in Scriven's uh, homeland off the north of Ireland. Born as it was, this hymn, 
that now goes by the title What a Friend We Have in Jesus was born from a life with many tragedies and a great deal of goodness. And I was thinking about this while I was researching and recording. I'm not someone who tries to take the religion out of religious history, and I'm not doing that here. The Christ-centered message of the poem shouldn't be watered down. That's not what Scriven intended when he wrote it. And I don't think, you know, whether you're a person of that religion, a different religion or no religion, that the only way we can empathize with people in the past is if we agree with them. Um, but what I will say supplemental to the religious as the spiritual message of what a friend we have in Jesus, I was thinking about that really obvious point I made earlier in that there's no phone, there's no video calls, there's no easy way to get back. And I know that sounds trivial and staggeringly obvious, but it's one of those things that you think and then really think about. And for people who emigrated, it must have been like a kind of death for their families the likelihood that they would never see them again, not just live with them again, that physically they would never see this person again was very, very high uh, in the in the 1800s when Scriven was writing. And so along with the spirituality of the song, I think there's something unifying about music. And I have to wonder about the idea of Jesus as the universal figure at the heart of Christianity and music being the universal um, the universal unifier at the heart of the human experience. And I think about Jane Scriven reading this and congregations in Banbridge singing this while congregations in Ontario were singing it. So I think there's, there's a universality about music that I find very moving. But this is the first verse of what a friend we have in Jesus, lyrics by Joseph Smith. 